So tonight we're having a very exciting event, and I think we'll enjoy it, and my introduction will be brief, is to hear from our three distinguished um, monastic visitors here this year, and I'll introduce them more in a moment, but Swami Sarvapriyananda, Shweta Chaitanya, Akshar Parthana, three uh, distinguished academics who have come here for serious study this year, but to inaugurate this new program for the year by having them speak on a more personal level about how it is that they came to their own communities, what it means for them to take up the monastic calling, and how they see studying as fitting into that. So I think it'll be an exciting time for us to, to reflect on the meaning of their being here and to celebrate their presence in our midst. A little bit of background perhaps will help. Um, Harvard Divinity School, now in its third century, uh, has in recent decades distinguished itself by venturing to be more robustly interreligious. And so by saying that the tradition out of which the school grows remains important, the Protestant Christian tradition, but that in the 21st century the school is at the service of the wider American community and international community of people of so many different faith traditions, uh, people who are seeking and searchers and trying to bring it together in a community of learning where faculty and staff and students can learn with one another and be able to understand each other's traditions in a more robust and deep fashion. In fact, it's very appropriate for us to be in this building tonight, the Center for the Study of World Religions, founded in 1960, uh, dedicated on its first day in 1960 by Dr. Radhakrishnan, came from India especially for that purpose, which was founded to have at Harvard Divinity School a, a community space where people would live in the apartments here study the other traditions, but also have neighbors belonging to the other traditions. And I think in some ways this program is a, a continuation of that practice. Likewise, I think it is a divinity school, and a divinity school we're very concerned about the theory, the critical understanding of religion, the history of religions, but also about the lived practice. What does it mean to be a member of a community, to be a practitioner? And I think this program is very much in that model of honoring the fact that people think and also practice and believe according to the things that they understand. One of the models that we have for what we're beginning this year is the well-established Buddhist ministry program at Harvard Divinity School. So donors years ago gave money to bring in Buddhist monastics from Asia and then bring in some for longer-term study to reflect on campus the importance of the Asian Buddhist communities, all the different parts of Asia coming here and being here present. And I think it's a wonderful thing that South Asia, the Hindu communities of India, are now going to be part of the same mix. And we have three wonderful representatives who look the part. Uh, they're very good about wearing their monastic garb around campus in a way that is welcoming. So to be outstanding, to be seen and noticed as they walk around campus, but also not off-putting, but rather saying, we're here, we'd love to talk to you, we're here because we want to learn from you and to mix it up together. And I think this is part, again, of the great venture of Harvard Divinity School in the 21st century, is to represent in what it looks like the way in which it wants to be this interreligious space over the years. And this, I think, is a growing enterprise, a growing movement um, that we are happy now to be part of. Uh, there's a, another occasion we might talk about the newly released book that has just come out, Hindu Approaches to Spiritual Care. Chaplaincy in theory and in practice. It gets about 25 or 30 distinguished practitioners and professors writing about campus ministry, chaplain, chaplaincy in hospitals, and other forms of service in the community from a Hindu perspective, and to find ways to make that also part of our life in this program here. Uh, I, I must immediately, I do have a number of people to thank, but thank um, Vibhu and Ajit Nagral, who are here anonymously in the crowd with us tonight for their generous support. When I raised the idea with them several years ago of having this kind of program, they immediately responded well, and they really uh, took up the possibility, the imagination of jumping into this project. Let's see what happens. Uh, they've been involved with it uh, right from the start. They've been very friendly to us and very gracious in coming here tonight and being here and supporting us in what we do. So thank you both for for your support. <laughs> and finally, before introducing our, our monastic guests, uh, there are other people I'd just like to thank. Um, there are too many people to thank. I've already mentioned 
thanking the staff of the Center for the Study of World Religions and Professor Stang, the director of the center. Also the Office of Academic Affairs the, um, has been very helpful from beginning to end of setting up this project. Uh, Sheila Dennis, the Associate Dean for Development and External Relations. Kristen Anderson, Dean of Administration. Uh, Beth Flaherty, who makes it all work by waving her magic wand over the finances of this project and, and bringing it to uh, completion. There are so many people to thank. Um, <coughs> Emily Farnsworth, where's Emily? Um, oh, there's Emily, who wrote up the wonderful piece that is at the Harvard Divinity Site about this project and also in the Harvard Gazette. Jonathan Beasley and Mike Norton in the uh, communications office. Christy Welsh, who made the wonderful poster that we have for this occasion, and others. And I, I think I'll stop there, otherwise we'll go all night just with thank yous. So what I thought I would do is introduce our speakers one by one. Uh, the first one will speak, then um, I'll introduce the second, then the second will speak, and I'll introduce the third. And then after the three of them have spoken, um, if I'm um, inspired, I may ask a penetrating question for all three of them <laughs> just to get started and then open it up for your discussion. And we'll break up the formal session around 7 p.m., but of course people will be welcome to stay around for a while. So our first presenter is Brahmacharini Shweta Chaitanya. Her Vedanta journey began when she began attending children's classes in Chinmaya Mission, Houston, when she was six years old. After completing her undergraduate study degree in Sanskrit at the University of Texas in Austin, one of the very best places to study Sanskrit in this country, uh, inspiration from the Vedanta teachings of the Chinmaya Mission compounded with her Sanskrit studies and led her to take up a two-year residential Vedanta course in Mumbai in 2014, so to go deeper into the Sanskrit in a lived practical tradition. After being trained in great depth by Swami Bodhatmananda for two years there, she came back and did a master's degree in South Asian studies at Columbia University in New York City. Then in 2017, the worldwide head of the Chinmaya Mission, Swami Swarupananda, initiated her into the monastic order as a brahmacharini, now with the name Shweta Chaitanya. Uh, posted now in Houston, uh, Shweta shares the message of Advaita Vedanta through discourses offered at the Chinmaya Mission in Houston, study groups across the greater Houston area, and for this special year right here in Boston. So let us welcome Shweta Chaitanya as our first speaker. <laughs> Hari Om, everyone. Oh, sorry. I'll stand here. <laughs> um, many thanks to everyone that uh, put this program together and allowed us the opportunity to uh, share with you all. And many thanks to everyone for uh, coming out to hear what we have to share. <laughs> OK. So this here on the uh, screen, this is Tukaram Maharaj. He was a saint poet of Maharashtra in the 17th century who wrote devotional poetry on the deity Vittal of Pandharpur. His poems reveal a rather unconventional poet who wrote very candidly and openly about his faith, his struggles with it, and of course, the incomparable peace he found through it. It was not common to write as bluntly as he did, but it made him accessible and lovable. This picture here was taken at the Gatha Mandir in, uh, in Maharashtra. Um, and along the walls of the temple, his poetry is inscribed. And one of the most profound sentences in red right there you'll see is, turn your phone off. <laughs> so, yes. So I thought I would, um, I thought I would, uh, in this uh, talk, I thought I would share my inspirations um, two main inspirations that I, that I had in life um, who truly gave me strength to uh, take up this Vedanta study seriously. So I thought I would share about uh, how they came in contact with my, in my life or how I came in contact with them in my life and what they meant to me. Okay. Today in Maharashtra, Santa Tukaram Maharaj is loved by many and is honored every year. His padukas, or footprints, are carried in a massive pilgrimage that starts from his hometown, Dehu, and goes all the way to Pandarpur, where they reach on the auspicious day of Ashadhi Ekadashi. 
Similarly, the padukas of other saints, like Santa Gnaneshwar, are carried in separate processions as well. They come together in Pandharpur, where the poets are finally united with their beloved Vitta. This procession is called the Vari, and those who participate in this on-foot journey are called Varkaris. I come from a family of several generations of Varkaris, the most recent one being my great uncle. Growing up, my parents would take me and my sister to their hometowns, their villages, for the duration of our summer vacation. There, we would get the opportunity to spend quality time with our family and the Varkari tradition. Our vacations would overlap perfectly with the Vari, and it just so happens that the Tukaram Vari stops for a night in my mother's village every year. For about a week before the procession arrived, the entire village would get together and start preparing food and making arrangements for the Varkaris. Everyone prepared as if Tukaram Maharaj himself was coming. When they arrived, we would perform arti for the padukas and serve dinner to the thousands of devotees. That night, we would sing kirtans for hours, sleep for maybe 30 minutes, and then offer arti once more to the padukas early in the morning. Before 6 a.m., the vari was already off to the next village. My experience with the Varkaris and with Tukaram Maharaja's poetry have been most precious in my life. The Varkaris I met over time had such beautiful and profound insights on life and such, calming pres and such a calming presence that I couldn't help but want to be like them. Some traveled with nothing and yet were joyous and at peace with each, with each other and with their surroundings. The Varkaris, my grandfather and my mother, soaked up the teachings of Tukaram at every chance they could get. But they also spoke highly of texts like the Bhagavad Gita, a text which Jnaneshwar later refashioned into Marathi Ovis, and it's famously known as the Jnaneshwari. Their words were so inspiring that I decided to explore those texts and others to whatever extent I could. But I quickly realized I didn't have the language skills necessary. And so my undergrad and master's experience revolved heavily around trying to fill that gap. And trying is the operative word there. <laughs> One thing led to another, and in 2014, I found myself in Mumbai at Sandipani Sadhanale Ashram as a student in the 16th Vedanta course. Swami Chinmayananda was the founder of this ashram. And that's him sitting down, and that's his uh, guru, uh, Tapoan Maharaj. He himself had studied Advait Vedanta in the Himalayas for some time under the guidance of, of Tapawan Maharaj. It is said that Tapawan Maharaj told Swami Chinmayananda that in order to teach him, Swamiji would have to meet two non-negotiable conditions. The first one, no note taking. And the second one, when a question is asked about class material, Swami Chinmayananda would have to answer correctly. I don't know what to say other than I'm deeply grateful that Swami Chinmayananda was able to abide by these conditions <laughs> and that I'm perhaps more grateful that he did not expect his students to abide by such conditions. <laughs> Prior to his studies, Swamiji was a freedom fighter and a journalist and had a fervent passion to serve. With that spirit, he came back down to the plains to make the teachings of Advait Vedanta available to all. He shared what he knew in English with men and women alike, regardless of caste or creed. So that's, as I mentioned, Tapawan Maharaj, and this is Swami Chinmayananji sitting down. In 1963, he welcomed the first batch of students to his ashram, where they were taught the principal texts of Advait Vedanta, or the Prasthantrayi, in light of the commentaries authored by Adi Shankaracharya. After the course, students were free to choose whether or not they wanted to be initiated into the monastic order. From the very first batch, he openly initiated both men and women. This unapologetic side of Swami Chinmayananda drew me to his teachings and to the ashram. I was not planning to join the monastic order when I joined the course, but the more I learned about it, the more I was inspired to follow that path. Time and space to grow in learning and practice 
was exactly what I was looking for, and I feel I have found it in monasticism. I am only just beginning my journey, but I know I can forever lean on my two pillars in life, Tukaram Maharaj and Swami Chinmayananda, for guidance along the way. So now, I thought I would share some pictures and some information about how, the, uh, how a day in the Vedanta course goes by. Um, so first we start off with our 4 a.m. wake up call. <laughs> Apparently there was a bell that used to ring at 4 a.m. that uh, I never heard, so. Um, <laughs> but I did wake up at four uh, from day one or even 3.45 sometimes, and not to do any spiritual practice, but because I needed ample time to account for all of my failed attempts at draping a sari for the first time. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, this right here is, uh, it's now renovated, but I wanted to show a picture of, of what the Swami Chinmayanandaji's kutia, or his, uh, where he stayed in the ashram, what it looked like. Um, you can see it right there, of course it's, it, it is renovated from what it was, um, but it was a very nice place for us to go and meditate or uh, uh, just reflect on the teachings uh, of that day or previous classes. All right. Our very first class of the day was Vedic chanting, and this would happen at 5.30 a.m. Here we learned how to uh, chant uh, different Veda mantras um, in the Krishna Yajurveda style of chanting. And so this is my, uh, this is a picture from my batch. And on the very, I guess your right side, the very right side, that arm that you can see is mine. <laughs> so, um, after Vedic chanting from six to seven, we had about an hour to do meditation or to review um, again, for reflection, so many people would go to the kutia that I showed you, um, or you could do this in your room. Um, it was also a time to sort of, again, review class material. Um, and it was also a time that if you wanted a cup of chai, you could go get one at 6 o'clock. At 7 a.m., we had our first class, and that was the, uh, it was mainly an Upanish Upanishad class that happened at 7 a.m., and so this is what our uh, classroom looked like. It was called the Saraswati Nilayam. Um, I'm being self-indulgent. But in the second row, the first person is me. <laughs> um, so, but this is what our class looked like. And we had these, these nice little desks that we could use uh, to follow along with the teachings. Um, this was our Guruji. His name was Swami Bodhatma Nandaji. And he was our acharya or teacher for the duration of the two years. And it is from him that we learned all of our Upanishadic knowledge, all of our uh, knowledge of Shankar Bhashya or the commentaries written by Shankar Acharyaji. Um, he was a guide. He was, uh, he was everything for us <laughs> in those two years. Um, and uh, it was a very special bond that we all created with our, our teacher. And, and, uh, it's one that I'll never forget. After our Vedanta class, we, had, we would go for breakfast at 8, 8 o'clock. And uh, this is our dining hall. Uh, this picture is not from the batch that I attended, but from the batch that was that just finished. Um, but as you can see, we, we all used to line up, get our food, and then uh, sit and quietly eat. Um, after this, uh, at 9, was again a, a break for studying. Or many times um, I saw that you know, many people would form study groups and would study together. Um, it was also a time for people who wanted to study more Sanskrit. They could do that. Um, I, I did it. Um, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a class where they taught us um, a text called Lagu Siddhanta Kaumudi. And so I studied that uh, from 9 to 10 um, every day. With another, with a group of a group of uh, other students. Then f at 10:30 was the official Sanskrit class, and so we would have Sanskrit class, and it was divided by uh, level. So those who were uh, fresh to Sanskrit would meet on certain days, an intermediate level would meet on certain days, and then advanced level would meet on certain days. After that, at uh, sorry, after that at 12 we had Stotram class. 
um, where we would learn devotional compositions, uh, mainly written by Adi Shankaracharyaji, but we would also learn things like Vishnu Sasranam, Lalita Sasranam. Um, we learned uh, Shiva Sasranam. Actually, Lalita Sasranam, I scratched that. We learned that later. But Shiva Sasranam, we did learn. Um, and we also learned how to conduct 16-step um, puja during that time period. Then at 12.30, we had lunch. After lunch, uh, we used to walk. And, and it was something started by our uh, Swamiji. Uh, he would walk, and then we would follow, like a flock of birds after. And he would ask us questions about class material. Um, and it was very kind of rapid fire style. He would ask anyone a question, and we had to be able to uh, answer. It was nothing like what Swami Chinmayananda went through with his teacher, but uh, we got a little flavor of it here. Um, after this walk, from about 1.30 to 4.30, we had a larger break where um, we could nap, do laundry, of course, study. Um, it was a very uh, uh, precious time for all students. They got to kind of recoup from their 4 a.m. wake-up call. Um, then at 4.30, we had our next Vedanta class. At 5.30 was another break where many students would bathe, they would do their sandhyavandanam, um, and they would get ready for arti, which happened at 6.30 in the temple. And um, all of us would chant the arti, which was taken from the Mahanarayan Upanishad. We would chant it on, uh, on rotation. So every day was someone's turn to chant arti. It was a very nice experience. Um, and then in the temple itself, at 7, we would have the last class of the day, which was a uh, more bhakti-oriented class. And so the texts that we learned were the Tulsi Ramayan as well as Srimad Bhagavatam. And so those are large texts, so naturally it took a long time, and that's all we could cover in the two years. But it was um, a wonderful time. Those who, were, who wanted to sing would sing in the first 10 minutes, um, and then we would get into class. After that was dinner at 8. And then, again, the walk, with followed by rapid-fire questions and walking. Um, and then we could retire for the day. Um, and many students would study a little bit more. And then by 11 o'clock, 11.30, we would go to bed. Um, so I had a few more slides, but I think I, I don't want to use up too much time. But uh, I hope this uh, kind of... Um, was a good summary of uh, what we did in the in the in the course, um, and I'm uh, happy to have this opportunity to share my experience with all of you. Thank you. So thank you, Shweta, for a wonderful and very vivid presentation. Our dean, David Hempton, is sitting in the back row, and I could hear his pen scratching during the whole session taking notes about how to run a divinity school. So, so changes will be coming soon. Our second presenter tonight is Sadak Akshar. Uh, Akshar was born and raised in Gujarat in India. For the past six years, he has been a student at the Baps Swami Narayan Sanskrit Mid, uh, Mahavidyalaya in Sarangpur. I was happy to visit there about two years ago and met, in fact, met him there a very intense training center dedicated to study, to a simple life, and to spiritual practice. It's a very wonderful place to visit. It's a college of the Somnath Sanskrit University as well. Uh, Akshar specialized in Sanskrit in the study of the Prasthantrayi, so the Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutras, and the Upanishads, and received both his BA and his MA in Swami Narayan Vedanta. He remaining steeped in the traditional learning and teaching style of a seminary transformed, all this transformed his thinking and helped shape his perspectives on religion, theology, history, philosophy, and other topics related to the academic life and also to personal life. During those six years, he also learned well, learned as well as taught Sanskrit texts, including the Gita and the Upanishads. Uh, these are the texts that he's very interested in but also the vernacular scriptures of the Swami Narayan Sampradaya, particularly the uh, Vachanamrit and the Swamini Vato, and the scriptures and practices even of other traditions as well, and he's expanding that horizon this year. When he's not studying, which is rarely, um, he enjoys participating in and helping organize the many Hindu festivals which occur during the year. After this year at Harvard, 
he plans to join the Swami Narayan Seminary in Sarangpur and embark on the further stages of monastic learning. So welcome, Akshar. Gunati Toksharam Brahma Bhagavan Purushottamaha Jano Janan Idam Satyam Muchate Bhava Bandanat Om Aksharamaham Purushottamadasosmi Welcome everybody. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about three main things. Uh, the first one is I'm going to introduce the tradition which I belong to and I come from. The second thing is uh, how I came into this tradition. And the last thing, how I'm going to uh, join uh, being a sadhu, being a monastic. So the first thing, I'm from Swaminarayan tradition. The Swaminarayan Sampradaya came into existence with the incarnation of Bhagwan Swaminarayan in the year of 1781. Throughout his life, Bhagwan Swaminarayan initiated sadhus, inspired them to live moral and pious life. He created renunciants who work selflessly for God and society. He also promised to remain ever present on earth through a continuous lineage of spiritual successor. After Bhagwan Swaminarayan, was Gunatitanan Swami, and after him was Bhagatji Maharaj and Shastriji Maharaj. Shastriji Maharaj formalized the organization by registering it and establishing five mandirs, the first one being in Bochasan. The name of the tradition was Bochasan Vasi Sri Akshar Purushottam Swami Narayan Sanstha, big name. Do not worry, it will become small. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so it is known as BAPS and also as BAPS. So, Bochasan Vasi, Sri Akshar Purushottam Swaminayan Sanstha. Bochasan Vasi means to be based in Bochasan, which is a small village in the western part of uh, India in Gujarat. Akshar Purushottam. Second and the third words are the doctrine which Bhagwan Swaminarayan gave. He talked about five different entities, Jeev, Ishwar, Maya, Brahm, and Parabrahm. So, Brahman and Parabrahman, like either way. So, Believing, one, believing oneself as Atma and as Akshar and to worship Paramatma, that is Purushottam. This was the main doctrine. And this is from Swaminarayan tradition. So the fourth word is Swaminarayan. And Sanstha is again a Sanskrit word, which means organization or community. Hence, Bochasan Vasishri Akshar Purushottam Swaminarayan Sanstha, BAPS or BAPS. Then came Yogiji Maharaj. Yogiji Maharaj was the one who spread this doctrine of Aksha Purushottam beyond the borders of India. Through his vision, guidance, and love, youths began to perfect their sadhana. This gave youths new identity and purpose. After Yogiji Maharaj came Pramukh Swami Maharaj, who inspired me into sadhu fold, and we are going to look at the, his life uh, in the presentation. And then came the present guru, Mahant Swami Maharaj. So, second point. How I joined the Swaminan tradition? In fact, I was born in this tradition. My parents were Swami Narayan. And from my childhood, I used to go to temple, do the arti, do puja every day in the morning. But there was one issue. I was part of the tradition, but tradition was not part of me. So I was doing everything but I didn't have real meaning why I am doing it. Generally, those who are raised in the, in the tradition would experience that, first of all, uh, small children imitate their parents. So I was doing the same. But it so happened that after completing my 12th grade, I went to Bangalore, South India, to study engineering. And I sat at it. It was going well, but there were assignments dues, tension, and everything was there. During weekends, I used to go to temple nearby and listen to the discourses. The discourses were from the scriptures, like Krishna giving uh, Updesh to Arjuna and so on, and also from the Vachnamut and Swami Nivato. So before I used to hear these uh, scriptures and these discourses, but now they were making sense because my situation was like Arjuna. 
I got, I was unable to go back to Gujarat to my parents, nor I, nor I was able to go to my classroom. So over there, while I was studying the scriptures, what happened was that I was attracted towards studying and learning more about Sanskrit and our scriptures. So I decided that I will study Prasthana Trai. Trai refers to three things, the Gita, the Upanishads, and the Brahma Sutras. Three things, small word. But to, uh, uh, to learn the scriptures, you should learn Sanskrit. And I didn't have any background in Sanskrit. And therefore, what happened was that, so to study Sanskrit, you should be starting from child. Right? There are Patshalas who teaches Sanskrit, and you should be patient. I wasn't child, and I wasn't patient. <laughs> All right. But what happened was that, then I decided that I will study it. So I went to Sarangpur in Gujarat, India. Sarangpur is a small village over here, the place. The people with whom I studied uh, and the environment changed me. I studied the scriptures and, uh, and also I was inspired to be a sadhu. I joined the Sanskrit Patshala, which was named BAPS Swaminan Sanskrit Patshala. Patshala, a school which uses traditional methods, teaching methods. So there is a guru-disciple relationship. You go to guru and study. You go to teacher and study scriptures. Memorization. Every day in the morning, we used to memorize mantras and verses. One of the greatest thing in Sarangpur was that Pramukh Swami Maharaj was there, my guru. I spent my first three years with him, with my guru, in class. We used to study Gita, Upanishad, and the Brahma Sutras. So in Gita, if I am studying, Dva Vimo Purusha Loke, Sharas Chakshara Mevacha, Shara Sarvani Bhutani, Kutas Thokshara Uchyate, Uttamaha Purusha Paramatma Iti Udaharutaha. That that talks, uh, this verse talk, is from the 15th chapter, which talks about Kshar, Akshar, and Purushottam. But to me, when I went for darshan of Pramukh Swami Maharaj, I, I used to see that he is living these principles which are described, the virtues which are described in Gita and the Upanishads. His humility, his belief in God's, God as all doer, his devotion to God and his love for all are some of the things by which I got inspired. <clears throat> That's true that he has inspired millions and also visited thousands of villages and built hundreds of mandirs, like huge like Akshardham, varying from capital of India to Robbinsville, across the world. But what was more inspiring to me was that at the age of 92 and sitting in a wheelchair, he inspired me to live a life just as he did for his guru. And at that time, I decided that after I complete my master's in Sanskrit, I would like to become a sadhu, get initiated by, by the hands of Prang Sai Maharaj, and then live a life just as he did. In the year of 2016, it was 13th of August, he passed away. Then after Mahan Swami Maharaj came, and so now, uh, after a few years, I'm going to get initiated as a sadhu with the hands of Mahan Swami Maharaj. There were other things which also inspired me. Senior Santos in our Santashram. Santashram is a place where Santos stay. So I used to go and sit with Santos, hours and hours, talking about life, the situation which I was facing in my daily life, and also talking about spiritual progress. The teachers who, come, who came every day to teach us Gita, Upanishad, and other scriptures, they were very patient. Yes, really patient. I wasn't doing homework for a couple of days, but like they were fine. They used to give me counsel that, Akshar, you should do your homework. I was small at that time six years back. But yes, they were passionate. <laughs> <they were passion. laughs> also, my friends, Jignesh, Jignesh, Vandan, and Sagar, I was lucky to study with them. They were the ones was, who were studying next to me, but they were ahead in the spiritual path. With Vidvatta, they were driving for Sadhuta. Vidvatta is attaining knowledge and just memorizing the scriptures. But Sadhuta is something different. That's the other part and difficult part. That is to imbibe the virtues which you study in your life. I saw it in my friends. They used to wake up early in the morning. Why? Just to please and just to imbibe the virtues which, are, which were given in the Shastras. 
adjacent to our patshala was Sant Talim Kendra, training center for swamis. Youths who wish to enter the life of renunciation comes, come to Sarangpur as a sadhak. So I am a sadhak. After sufficient introspection and clear understanding of spiritual goal, sadhak gains ability for initiation. Then the sadhak is initiated by the guru as parshad. In parshad, you get a new name. Sadhak is generally for three years. Parshad is for one year. After passing this one year, you will be initiated as a sadhu. The, the seven year sadhu training wherein any person cultivates four main things. These are some of the photos when parshads are initiated as sadhus. The first one is service. Second, knowledge. Third, devotion. And the fourth one is austerity and unity. Service or seva. The first step on the spiritual path is service or seva. While performing seva, sadhus ignore personal comfort and remain ready to serve, regardless of place, time, and circumstances. Here, seva is not a mere physical act, but a spiritual endeavor, leading to hum unity, humility, and God's grace. This is the photo of uh, santos and sadhaks and parshads going for flower picking. This is, uh, there are different sevas which rotates every 15 days. So early in the morning at 5 o'clock, or, or in the evening, uh, sadhak or santos go, for, go in the garden for picking up the flowers, roses and other flowers. But the process was interesting. Garden was nearby 300 meters. But when the groups of santos, parshados, and sadhakos go, go, they were in groups. They had baskets in their hands. There was cold breeze, 23 degree temperature. And then they were talking amongst themselves the positive things which we have seen throughout the day. Moreover, some were singing devotional bhajans, Mogarana fool asakhi, Mogarana fool. Moreover, others were revising. Others and some others were memorizing scriptures which they have to appear, for exam, next, the very next day. So this process was interesting to me. The second thing is knowledge. Along with seva, knowledge is important. A part of the training, sadhus immerse themselves in learning two main things. The first, the eternal principles of Brahman and Parabrahman. Second, moral and spiritual ideals through the lives and work of Bhagwan Swami Narayan and his spiritual successors, Gunaditanan Swami, all up till Mahant Swami Maharaj. The third thing which they learn there is devotion. Bhakti is an important and integral part of sadhus life. Throughout the day, sadhu attend artis, spiritual discourses, meditation sessions, and visit sacred sites to pray and offer devotion. Bhakti fills their day with divinity and channels their focus towards God. The fourth thing is austerity. Bhagwan Swami Narayan gave five main vows for sadhus. The first one, Nishkam. Nishkam is the vow of eightfold celibacy. Second is Nirlob. It is the vow of renunciation of wealth. The third one is Niswad. It is the vow of eating sanctified food in a wooden bowl after mixing water to it. The fourth one is Nisne. Nisne is the vow of detachment from one's relative and accepting the entire world as one's own family. And the last one, Nirman, is the vow of remaining humble. It was the year of 2015 when this photo was taken. This is Sarangpur, Pramukh Swami Maharaj sitting amongst the sadhu. Uh, there are currently 1,100 sadhus uh, in BAPS, and I'm going to be one of them, and th this is the greatest thing in my life. In the end, I would like to ask for blessings from all of you, and I would pray in the fits of my Guru Mahan Swami Maharaj that just as he has pleased his guru, I can please my guru, Mahan Swami Maharaj. In the end, I would conclude by a verse written by Bhadrashda Swami, who is the only living Bhashyakar right now. 
एवं ध्यावाद्नायाँ अनुवृत्त वर्तनम सर्वथा सर्वदा भूया प्राथय भद्रभाव Thank you very much, Akshar, for a beautiful presentation. And it's one of these rare occasions where people aren't leaving, but more people are coming into the room <laughs> as we go along. In fact, the, the two presentations so far are so beautiful, I'm thinking some of our students will now renounce the world and, <laughs> and go off. So we have to keep them. Uh, I would like now to introduce our third speaker, who is a distinguished Swami of the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society. But before introducing him, I should mention that there's another distinguished Swami here. Uh, back there, you can pick him out in the crowd. Swami, <laughs> Swami Tyagananda, who is the Swami here in Boston for the Vedanta Society. And I've known Swami for about 30 years, uh, first in India and here. So welcome, Swami. Nice to have you with us. Um, <clears throat> so our final presenter then, Swami Sarvapriyananda, uh, joined the Ramakrishna Mutt and Mission in 1994 and received sannyas, his full monastic life, in 2004. Uh, Swami has served the Ramakrishna Mutt and Mission in various capacities, uh, some of them quite administrative, being a vice principal of the Deogar Vidyapit Higher Secondary School, principal of the Shikshana Mandara uh, Teacher Education College at Bellora Mutt itself, and indeed the first registrar of the Vivekananda University at Bellora Mutt. We had a speaker here a few weeks ago from, uh, from Bengal who turned out to have been a student when Swami was there as the registrar. So these, these worlds connect. And just before coming to America, Swami served as an acharya of the monastic probationers training center at Bellor Mutt, which is the very center of the Ramakrishna tradition. When he came to this country, he first served as assistant minister at the Vedanta Society of Southern California for 13 months beginning in December of 2015. And then he became the, the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society in New York and assumed his duties there in 2017. Um, and as he told me yesterday when I visited the center there, it's one of the oldest centers in the world. It's a very distinguished center, a beautiful brownstone building on 71st Street by the park in Manhattan. And Swami is part of a long lineage of very distinguished Swamis uh, leading that center. He is a well-known teacher. He's a popular lecturer. If you go online, you can find links to his talks everywhere. And we are very privileged to hear from Swami tonight. So welcome. Namaste and good evening. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here talking about something I love and, and love sharing. So I'll start with Swami Vivekananda. And the reason I start with Swami Vivekananda is not only he's at the beginning of our order, the Ramakrishna order, uh, but he was here in Harvard. I was researching him yesterday and I found Harvard Crimson uh, reporting uh, the first Hindu monastic ever to come to Harvard and speak. He was here in 1896 at the Silver Hall in uh, Harvard Yard and he gave a talk on Vedanta. But Harvard Crimson was not so much interested in Vedanta. They were interested in him. So the entire report is not about Vedanta. It's more about what a Hindu monk is like. Exactly today's subject, actually. <laughs> 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 and that was uh, 120 years ago. <laughs> so Vivekananda, uh, he came to this country in the World Parliament of Religions in 1893 in Chicago. And there you can see him there. Um, he spoke there representing all of Hinduism and he was the first Hindu teacher to travel outside India and talk about Hinduism and teach Hinduism. So, and there's also a connection to Harvard because Professor John Henry Wright, who was teaching in, at Harvard University, gave, gave him the glowing recommendation. He had no credentials to speak at the World Parliament and the credential he got was from Harvard University from <laughs> Professor uh, John Henry Wright who wrote a very, uh, effusive letter to the parliament that this person should be allowed to speak. And uh, he did, became a very popular teacher. Um, he came to New York, started the first Vedanta Society where I am and Professor Clooney spoke there uh, yesterday. 
but how did it all start? So Vivekananda, who was Narendranath Dutta in Calcutta in the 1880s, a young college student, and his quest was a spiritual quest, a simple question. Does God exist? Can I experience God? Can I see God? And he went around, I think, putting people on the spot, and great spiritual teachers at that time, um, asking them, have you seen God? <laughs> and what do you say to a question like that? But they finally said that there is a person who has actually seen God. You should go and ask uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who was the uh, priest at the temple of Kali on the bank of Ganga, whom most people considered crazy. Some people considered to be a, um, God realized. A, a few were beginning to talk of him as an incarnation of God. So anyway, Vivekananda, later Vivekananda, Narendranath at that time goes to Sri Ramakrishna and asks the question, have you seen God? And Sri Ramakrishna actually ref uh, replies in the affirmative, yes, I have seen him. I have seen God the way I see you, and you can see God too. And so Narendranath found his guru, and on his path to becoming Vivekananda, he came um, to this country, again inspired um, by the idea of spreading what he had acquired, the spiritual realizations he had acquired. In fact, the entire heritage of Indian spirituality, as he put it, 5,000 years of spirituality. He wanted to open it up to the world. And so he found a platform here in the World Parliament of Religions in 1893. And he taught here for um, a few years, and then he came back once more in the, at the end of the 19th uh, century. And then he went back to India, founded the order of which I am a part, and um, he didn't live long. He used to say, I won't live to see 40, and he died at 39. But the order continued to grow and has centers all over the world, about 180 centers now. And one of them was close to the place I lived when I was growing up. So my parents were, and my grandparents, were closely associated with this tradition. And um, uh, I used to go to the ashram, to, which was close to our house. And I grew up maybe the last generation before internet and <laughs> cable TV. And, um, so I grew up reading a lot of books. And a lot of books in the, in the house were uh, literature written by Swami Vivekananda. And what appealed to me was, is this really true, that God really does exist? Self-realization is actually possible, and I can do it too. And so that sort of, I really hoped it was true, <laughs> so because I really wanted to do that. And even when I was a little uh, schoolboy, I, I always felt that uh, this is what I should do in life. I didn't know too much about monasticism, but as I kept on visiting the monastery, I began to understand, looking at these monks, I felt, wait a minute, these people, uh, my, they're not, I mean, uh, my parents, uh, they have jobs and money and a house and cars and a family and people and things to do in life. And these people have nothing, none of, none of these. And they are so happy and they are at peace. Um, so that really attracted me. And I kept on reading. At one point, I decided I'm going to become a monk. Um, I was doing my MBA. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but uh, finally, I, I remember the, the last assignment. I just submitted that assignment. Before that, I had gone to, um, I had become initiated into a mantra in this order uh, by my guru, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, who was the 12th president of our order. And I had sort of, halfway through my MBA, I had gone uh, to the main monastery asking, can I become a monk? And uh, he very gently, he was in his 90s, he very gently said, what are you doing now? I said, I'm studying. Uh, how long will it take to complete? Is it over? He said, I had to say, no, it's one year. One more year is there. And very, very, very gently said, is it good to give up something halfway? Yeah. Uh, which was a very wise thing to say, actually. A lot of people, at least some people, want to become monks just before exams, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> I was doing some research for a, a midterm paper, Professor Clooney's paper, <laughs> and I found in the Imitation of Christ, it says, on the day of judgment, we shall not be asked what we have read. I thought, 
wait a minute. Every class we had asked, have you done the readings? <laughs> um, so I did go back and finish my studies, and then I uh, became a monk in the order. And what do I find? Um, what is this order all about? And this is very useful to understand the entire teaching of the order. This, was, uh, this is the logo, the emblem of the Ramakrishna order. Um, Swami Vivekananda actually designed it in New York. Uh, somebody came to him and asked, we need a, an emblem or a logo for a publication. Could you suggest something? And the description is he took a napkin from the uh, breakfast table and scratched something, uh, you know, sort of draw, drew something on, on, uh, with a pencil and tossed it across the table to the uh, printer and said, draw it to scale. And that became the uh, emblem of our order. And what does it mean? It's very actually, it's packed with symbolism. The swan there represents the hamsa, the symbol of the infinite, the absolute, of God, if you will. And the goal is to realize God. And how do you do it? The sun rising in the background symbolizes knowledge, spiritual knowledge, jnana. And it stands for jnana yoga, the path of knowledge. The lotus in the foreground stands for devotion or love. So bhakti yoga, devotion to God. The wavy waters symbolize work, action in the world. So a life of service and doing good to the world, karma yoga. And the serpent encircling the whole thing uh, symbolizes yoga, the yoga of meditation. Um, dhyana yoga or what Swami Vivekananda called Raja yoga. And the idea is by harmonizing all of these, by practicing all of these, uh, one attains to the vision of God. So in the order, if you look at the life of a, a typical monk of our order, you will find it's divided into uh, meditation and study and service and devotional acts. So early in the morning, we would get up um, in our training process in, a, in the main monastery in, in India. We'd get up at just like that, 3.40 in the morning, a bell would ring, and believe me, you, you heard it. <laughs> they would ma make sure that you heard it. I remember, I don't know, a senior Swami sitting here, I don't know whether I should share these. <laughs> uh, I remember there was one time, one of the novices got so exasperated with the 3.40 a.m. bell that he actually hit the bell. <laughs> but the person whose duty it was to ring the bell was very uh, resourceful. So he took out a, a big, steel plate and a steel cup and banged it all over the monastery, <laughs> which was worse, actually. <laughs> I remember uh, in our training period, two years of intensive study at the main monastery, we counted. We had 26 bells in 24 hours. And the most uh, disliked one was the one at 10.30 p.m., which told you to go to sleep. Now, if you're already asleep, that was a very irritating <laughs> bell. <laughs> So in our order, to become a monk, one uh, spends 10 years or 9 to 10 years as a novice. You'd be dressed in white, and you have the sacred tuft of hair and the sacred thread, and you're called a brahmachari. And two years is spent in intensive training. Uh, we study uh, Vedanta intensively, the, the uh, Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, with the commentaries of Shankaracharya and some other commentaries too. Plus, we study other uh, philosophical texts, the introductions to the, the orthodox systems of philosophy, Sankhya and yoga and all of that, and uh, world philosophy, uh, other religions, at least an acquaintance with other religions. So all of that is done in, intensively in two years. But uh, there is a whole process of study and service and meditation and prayer which goes on in all of the centers of our order. So what Vivekananda did he introduced certain innovations. Uh, service was a very big uh, factor which he introduced. There was a lot of resistance from traditional uh, non-dualistic monks at that time. This is for householders, this is for people in the world. Why should monks run schools and colleges and hospitals and um, r relief activities in famine or flood? But over the years, it transformed Hinduism in certain ways. For example, even uh, right now, uh, there are most um, ashrams, monasteries where uh, there are monks, 
people go there and one of the things they ask is what kind of service activity that are you doing it's taken for granted it's a it's a revolutionary change really i mean i, mean, I was i can share with you that one of the shankaracharyas the four shankaracharyas in different parts of india who are um, who are part of the lineage started by the original shankaracharya 1200 years ago he visited our main monastery and we were novices at that time. We remember sitting around him. And one of the questions he asked was about the service activities and how they can start. Now, this is amazing. <laughs> this 1,200-year-old uh, 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 the Shankaracharya tradition. And they are asking how we can start uh, service activities for the welfare of people. So this is one of the ways in which he changed it. What uh, really do I find attractive in this particular tradition? I was thinking about it. One is this beautiful balance of discipline and freedom. For example, and it's important to me, there are no banned books. So I can read books of every tradition, whatever. Um, I remember one of the first things that I asked one monk um, when I joined the order. I went to the library and he found this nice collection of P.G. Woodhouse. I don't know how many of you have come across. <laughs> very humorous books. I asked, can I read P.G. Woodhouse as a monk? I was a new monk. And the monk said something very interesting. He said, of course, you can read anything you want. But if I find you reading P.G. Woodhouse all the time, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this beautiful balance of freedom. And uh, uh, recently I read Ken Wilbur, who was talking about why a lot of people, young people, especially in this country, they are drifting away from organized religion. So he makes three points. One is, he says, the um, clash with modern values. Sometimes organized religions, they tell us to believe something which we no longer believe in in this age. It goes against gender equality or certain things. The second thing he said was that the violence between religions, this really is very off-putting, off that um, um, violence, criticism, hatred between organized religions. And the third thing he said was the conflict which people see between reason and religion, religion and science, for example where something is taken as mainstream science and accepted by everything, and religion tells you, no, this is not the way it is. What was we taught 5,000 years ago, that you have to believe in. Now, what I liked about this tradition particularly was this freedom and this openness to new knowledge. Swami Vivekananda was all for uh, reason. For, he says, a man must not only have faith, but have intellectual faith too. Harmony between religions. This is another important thing which I found, that absolutely no criticism of other religions. Sri Ramakrishna said, as many faiths, so many paths to God. So very strongly, it, we, it's part of our tradition that uh, all religions are valid and all religions are true and deserve respect. And we can not only, not like an ivory tower separation from religions, but actually learn from other religions and enrich our own spiritual path. Um, I know. This kind of perennialism is not in academic fashion these days, but I'm sort of old-fashioned. Uh, I, <laughs> I prefer that kind of thinking. And um, openness to um, the, the values of the modern world. So this uh, uh, gender equality, we have a separate order for women. Swami Vivekananda thought about it um, more than 100 years ago. At that time, the burning issue back in India was uh, widow remarriage. Should widows be allowed to remarry? So there was an orthodox section who said, no, this is against religion. There was a reform section who said, yes, they should be allowed to remarry. And Swami Vivekananda's answer was very typical. They asked him, what do you, which side do you fall on on this issue? He said, um, why are you asking me? Am I a widow? <laughs> they were surprised. No, but you must have an opinion on this side or that side. And his answer was amazing. He said, give freedom and education to women and let them decide what they will do, whether they will marry or not marry. This seems um, not uh, rather bland, but many years uh, ago, I heard a historian in our, uh, one of our institutions giving a talk, this lady, she talked about that issue 100 years ago, widow remarriage, and she said, it's amazing that a question which is so obvious to women, no man ever thought about it. There was one woman writer at that time who wrote, saying that um, I hear certain men telling me I'm free to remarry, and I can hear some certain other men telling me I'm not free to remarry, but nobody ever asks me what I want. 
And if you am asked, I would say, I want the same freedom that men have. I want education and freedom. You see how Vivekananda, he just felt the pulse of, uh, of what was really needed. So all of these ideas, I found it very appealing, actually. Here is a beautiful picture of the uh, monks of our order taken a few years ago in front of the main temple. This is the temple of Sri Ramakrishna in India. So after 10 years, you take the orders and you become a monk. And your daily life is this harmony of meditation and service. In India, of course, we have a lot of service activities, schools, colleges, hospitals, even a university. Uh, here, our service activity is basically teaching. Teaching, very interesting. The whole idea, there's no idea of conversion, that you have to be converted into, uh, from, uh, Hindu, uh, from Christianity or Judaism into uh, Hinduism, absolutely nothing. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm in that center, the first Vedanta Society, 125 years, it's been running there. And if today somebody comes and asks me, I, I want to be converted into something else, I wouldn't have the first idea to do, uh, not know what to do, you know. So the idea is to teach these, uh, these uh, principles of harmony and high spirituality and let people broaden their uh, approach to spiritual life. Um, and then, uh, so, so there is this meditation and study and uh, service activities uh, there. I have been in a school, I've taught school children, um, been an administrator as Professor Clooney said. Devotional activities, uh, prayer, uh, there is singing. Uh, I'm a very poor singer. So <laughs> but, uh, and ritualistic puja. Uh, you will find all kinds of ritualistic pujas going on in, in Belur Mat. And you will find ashrams like, uh, there's an ashram in the Himalayas place, in a place called Mayavati with absolutely no ritual at all. You're not even allowed to bow down in, the, in front of a picture. So all of this tremendous uh, variety of approaches to spiritual life you find uh, in this order. It's, again, something that's very attractive to me. Uh, I could go on, but we will talk about it in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Swami. The one thing you didn't tell us is where you are in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> you can just point anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of orange. <laughs> So I would ask our three speakers to turn their chairs around, but don't blind yourself with the um, light so that we can now open it up for discussion. So if you just flip your chairs. So you have these beautiful traditions of learning, and you've all been studying Vedanta, you've been learning Sanskrit, and so forth. Suddenly you show up at Harvard Divinity School, uh, only a bare two months ago. I wonder if I could ask each of you to say one of the things that surprised you most, like educationally or how things are done here when you came here. Just like one example each, and then we can open it up for further discussion. What surprised you? Um, this maybe isn't much of a, nothing has surprised me as such, I, I guess because I, I went to school uh, here in the US. Um, but one thing that I greatly appreciate is the amount of uh, resources that are available to students um, in this university setting. Um, and that is entirely unique to uh, this university setting, and I think here, especially at Harvard, it's um, especially unique. Um, the kinds of things that are available on Hollis, in the libraries, uh, you, you just can't get anywhere else uh, with, with this kind of ease of accessibility. So. That was one of the things that uh, I, I, I truly appreciate uh, about being here. So you have another six or eight months to madly download yes. PDFs? <laughs> Swami. Everything surprised me. <laughs> I, I haven't been to school in the last 25 years, and that was back in India. And here I am at Harvard, of all places. Uh, I, one thing I did was when I was in the United States, I made it a point to take every opportunity to visit university campuses. I never got to come to Harvard earlier, but other, other campuses. And I used to think that these are the temples of the United States, these are magnificent institutions. I think God must have heard this. Uh, <laughs> so you have this desire in your mind to be in an American university. Go to Harvard. <laughs> but it was, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I love libraries, so what she, well, the Widener Library, they were telling me it's the um, the largest academic library in the whole world. The 
company of extraordinarily smart people, uh, both teachers and students from all over the world. Uh, that is something. How everything is online now, that's <laughs> that was what it took some uh, getting used to. Um, I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> oh, sure. Suddenly the mic seems heavy. Right. But, uh, there were many things uh, which surprised me when I came here. So I came, I came from Gujarat, Park Shala, and over here there were many new things. Uh, but what remained was was same: this study, this studies which I'm, I was studying back there and here. Subjects have changed, but the way I'm studying it is almost the same, and which is helping me, in fact. So uh, I have studied Prasthana Trayi for five, year, five and a half years, and now I am here, I have taken five courses in this semester, and also learning English, because this is new for me. So uh, there are many resources over here, as Shweta Ji said, and generally, we don't used to go to library and study. We used to study at our own place. Well, over here, uh, there are many libraries, and I also started using the libraries and resources. Um, also, expanding my horizons. So in Sarangpur, uh, I was a student of Vedanta, so I studied uh, uh, the Upanishads. Whereas over here, I'm taking a course with uh, Professor Patel about Nyaya, which is completely new for me. Not completely, but new for me. And also, studying different perspective to study the same things which I have studied back in, back in Sarangpur. I'm taking a course with Professor Clooney on the Upanishads. So I have studied it from the Swaminarayan perspective. Over here, I'm studying it from many different perspectives. And also, there are some subjects which surprise me the most every class, theories and methods. <laughs> um, but yes, everything is going well. <laughs> So our speakers have not only been wonderful speakers, but fairly brief. So we, we will continue until we have plenty of time. And I would just encourage you, uh, ask a question if you have a specific question for one of our speakers, or aiming at all three. And, and try to be brief and make sure there's a question mark at the end of your <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> Who would like to uh, ask a question first? Yeah, oh yes, please. Uh, three of you are representing uh, different uh, uh, orders of uh, Hindu philosophy and Hinduism. Uh, and one of the goal is uh, uh, achieving harmony and inner peace, and ultimately uh, moksha or realization. Do you feel all the years you've spent till now, are you leading towards that path? I'm not going to ask you, have you seen God? But uh, do you feel, are you in the right path and what all the audience can get from that? Straight answer, yes. Not a day goes by without my feeling that, yes, the path that I've chosen I don't mean just particularly my particular order or philosophy, but the general spiritual path. Uh, there is something really deep and very worthwhile. I would say the most worthwhile thing in all of human life. And it's not just for monastics, monastics are specialists, but it's for everybody. Everybody should be spiritual in whatever way uh, they understand it. And it's a journey. Uh, over the years, this much I can say that my understanding of what spirituality is, my understanding of what Advaita is, what the purpose of all of it is, this has just deepened over. And, and my appreciation for other paths has also deepened. Uh, definitely. I, I would also uh, say a definitive yes. Um, I'm very early in my uh, uh, life as a monastic, but um, I have a tremendous faith in uh, the teachings, but also the practices associated with those teachings. And I think the faith in those practices um, are, are very, it's a very dear faith to me. I feel that uh, if anything, that's the one thing I would, I would never want to compromise. And I think that's kind of the fuel behind, uh, that's uh, the fuel for me to, to move forward on this path. So I would say, uh, yes, I do feel I'm Getting closer only because there's a I have a faith in the in the practice and the teachings. Uh, 
to me it uh, seems that uh, after I joined this uh, faith from my heart, what I have experienced is that uh, I am getting a new perspective in my life. So, for example, uh, before I was self-centered, thinking about myself, harmony, unity, these were the words, like I was not practicing it, and so on. But now that when I have studied the scriptures, so I have the words with me, I also have somebody who is living it. And uh, this bhavna, this feeling of uh, getting near uh, to everybody, it doesn't matter if it belongs to uh, different tradition or even different religion, is something which is happening now. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, this is default because my guru is such that. Uh, Pramukh Swami Maharaj, uh, you may have heard about Epij Abdul Kalam's name. Uh, Epij Abdul Kalam wrote books, and his last book was on Pramukh Swami Maharaj, entitled with Transcendence. So the contract is uh, the contra contrast is such that Epij Abdul Kalam is a Muslim following Islam. Pramukh Swami Maharaj is a, a guru from Hinduism, from Hindu faith. But still there is a connection between them. The connection is such that, that APJ Abdul Kalam writes in his book that Pramukh Swami Maharaj is my ultimate guru. So, uh, like in a way, Pramukh Swami Maharaj didn't speak English and APJ Abdul Kalam didn't speak Gujarati, Gujarati, but there was a relation. So, we can see that uh, through my, uh, I have seen through my guru and also I'm experiencing it that this studying this and being in this faith and this uh, as a sadhu, I would uh, reach towards my goal. Wonderful, thank you. Another question? Parimal, do you want to please? This is Professor Parimal Patel from the South Asian Department. I mean, having all three of you here is such a remarkable and wonderful opportunity for all of us, and also I think for Harvard, for the Divinity School. And it's been really nice to hear that it's also been at least so far, meaningful for all of you. I'm curious as to, you shared with us something about your journey to becoming monastics. I'm wondering what you'll share when you go back about this interlude at Harvard <laughs> and being students. You <laughs> can go in any order. You don't have to go in the same order. So. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be a trick. Um, yes, I've. Uh, I would. I would probably have a better answer at the com at sure. the completion of this, uh, um, you know, fellowship. But uh, right now, I feel what I would. I would love to share with, uh, you know, with uh, those back in Houston, um, and other members uh, that I are not members, but people that I meet, is um, that there are so many ways to look at one tradition. There's so many ways to look at uh, one text. And, uh, and there's something to gain from every single view, um, every single perspective. And that uh, looking at something from, and I feel that that's what's being done here, is that so many different perspectives are brought into the readings of, let's say, the Upanishads or, or any other text. Um, that when you're kind of, in this case, I, this is one of the most difficult things I feel for me, and we, Swamiji and I were talking about this the other day, but to kind of put myself in the other, you know, in the other side and, and look at, or in someone else's shoes and look at the Upanishads um, after having been marinated in one way of looking at it. Um, um, it is difficult, but there's so much that I'm gaining from looking at things from a different perspective. Um, and, and actually a deeper appreciation for these, these very texts. Um, and so what I would take back is, is um, this openness to, to view these texts and to be fearless in, in things that you find out from different perspectives and to not allow those things to feel that, oh, well, now I can't study because I know this now. No, it, I feel like it can enrich uh, one's journey with, with these traditions. So that's what I would share. <laughs> One of my brother monks said, not to me, to somebody else, oh, I know what's going to happen. He's going to go to Harvard and next year he's going to come back with loads of Harvard anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> so little stories uh, which he'll talk about in the, uh, in the course of his talks. Uh, so that's already happening. 
Uh, I, I, <laughs> I gave a talk where at, in San, San Jose uh, just last week, and I was talking about um, studying Tibetan Buddhism, the emptiness people, uh, for three hours from noon to 3 p.m. with Professor Garfield, and then Atman and Brahman and God and all the Upanishads with Professor Clooney from 3 p.m. to nearly 6 p.m. So uh, imagine the whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did the Buddhism first and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So I have, uh, I'll have loads to share, not only with people at large, but also with, uh, with our uh, organization who will expect a feedback from me at the end of my experience in uh, Harvard. Uh, it's going to be very positive feedback. <laughs> so your question was what I'm going to say after a year. But in fact, every weekend I, give, I send a report at my place. Uh, so they were so much curious. Raksha, do you still wear a dhoti? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. And, Raksha, are you going through all the readings? I said, I try. <laughs> so they are interested in many things. So they ask me question. Even if I don't have to say, if I don't want to say, they will ask me, twist the question, and they will ask me. So uh, yes, there are many things which I'm learning from Harvard. I'm sharing it back. So after a year, like, there will be so many things. Maybe a small book, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, there are many things at the end of the year I will imbibe in me. So uh, in fact, when I entered Harvard, I entered through that gate where it's written, enter to grow in wisdom. And I am currently gaining many things, learning many things. For this semester, I am studying, for the full semester, I am studying Buddhism, in which I am studying Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana. And in the next spring semester, I'm going to study Christianity and Judaism to get a holistic view on religion. So, yes, full of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see, oh, some of the younger people in the back. So, yes, sir. Um, so, <laughs> this is a right. sort of complicated thing. But uh, in a lot of religions, there's the concept that uh, religion protects you from what are called like marginal experiences. So if there's real traumas that you go through in your life, religion is able to sort of stabilize you and help you like continue living the, the good life. Um, so do you feel like there are, are such experiences that you like faced in your lives that have really led you down the monastic path? Or do you feel like you would have remained um, on the monastic path had you not gone through like the experiences that you have? This is an interesting question. I've actually um, taught monastic novices for about eight years, so hundreds of young men who want to become monks. And I've asked them sometimes questions about what led them to become a monk. And uh, the answers I get neatly fall into two categories. One is those who always wanted this life, a small group, uh, but they always felt they didn't know much about monasticism maybe, but a spiritual life, and they couldn't think of anything else. And there is such a group. Um, the second group is those who were in school and college just like everybody else and then suddenly made a decision. And that sudden decision could have come from many reasons. Uh, it could be a sudden shock, a death, a loss, um, a kind of a trauma, uh, or it could be just something positive, having read something, met somebody, something like that. Um, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, whatever brings you to spiritual life, not just monastic life, spiritual life. It's like taking a bath in the, the holy river Ganga. You may, you know, get ready and uh, put on your swimming clothes and go, go into the river. Or somebody may push you in or you may slip and fall into it. The result is you get wet. So <laughs> uh, that's the way I look at it. Uh, and after some time, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you would, whatever happened in the past which pushed you into this life, which inspired you or made you take up this life as a refuge, you will bless that, good or bad. Whatever it happened, it brought you to this life. This life becomes important. Um, so people have asked the same question that you've asked in a much more blunt way to me. Um, they'll see me and say, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I, I would actually, I, I'm, I'm totally, I totally would agree with how Swamiji just answered the question, um, in that it truly doesn't matter uh, in the sense when one is in the tradition and is 
has found some meaning in it and is continuing with it, then it, 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 it truly doesn't matter so much uh, where that came from. But I will say that our, um, uh, I had heard her early, early on that um, it is, monasticism shouldn't be something where one is running away from, from the world, like an escape from, I can't, I can't handle the world, so now let me try. Then that question's valid, what happened? Um, but, uh, but the idea that, that I, I had heard for, for so long was that it should, it should be more of a, an inquiry into something deeper, that uh, one has actually been very in touch with life and, and has been very ambitious with life, um, has faced it head on. And then further questions came up, and therefore the, uh, I guess, thirst for, for finding out something deeper um, came up. Um, but uh, yes, anyways, I've, I've heard your question in much more blunt forms. <laughs> to me, I'm a new, no I'm like a novice. In fact, I'm a sadha. So it happens many a times that there is a high tide, low tide. There are some good situations and some bad. So what I do in that kind of particular situation is that two things, Shastra and my Guru. Shastras are the scriptures which I have studied. Now it's time for me to live what, what has been said in the scriptures. So many a times I feel alone. Like I have many friends. In fact, uh, I didn't have a Facebook account. I came here and I started. There are 200 <laughs> friends right now. But, uh, <laughs> that's not the issue. But uh, like, I used to stay with people, among people. Over here, it's different. So uh, the Upanishad, the Ishavasya Upanishad, the very first verse says that Ishavasya Midam Sarvam, God is everywhere. Now, this was me, who I have studied. In fact, I have taught this, but now I have to apply on myself. So that is the first thing. And the second thing is, Guru, in the difficult situation, I can take guidance because they are the experts and they know everything. They know everything about me. That's what I believe. I believe. So what happens to me is that many a times I think that whether I will be able to do or not, I have many role models in front of me who have already done it. And I can even approach them and get the solution for it. So these are this were the two main things which I do, Shastra and my guru, scriptures and my guru. Uh, and then next, yes, next bit, and then we'll keep going over this way. So yes, sir. What are the, most, what are the greatest obstacles that you face or have to keep tabs on in your path to devotion? the greatest obstacles. Then you can go in any order you want. <laughs> yeah, it's not always plain sailing. But most of the real obstacles are internal, not, not external. It's a wonderful environment. If one wants spiritual life and wants monastic life, what better environment can there be than a monastery? Whichever order, tradition uh, you have. One advice I used to give to young novices who are just going to become monks was that or those who want to become monks yeah so people come to me and ask so I'm, I'm joining the order I'm going to this ashram I'm going to start my monastic life um, I say first burn your bridges no going back once you've made the decision before you made the decision or generally the senior monks will say don't become a monk they want to they, <laughs> they want to see whether you are pushing hard uh, one of my friends who's a doctor who became a monk um, he said, the first day I went to the monastery, the senior monk in the, um, uh, uh, there in the, uh, in the monastery spent half an hour convincing me why I should not be a monk. And then asked me, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to be a monk here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I, I say that you burn your bridges. Absolutely no looking back now. Um, Vivekananda said, you have spent many lives doing many things. Give one life to God and see. Yes. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, even if it's going to be wasted, give one life to God, and then he says, with his uh, characteristic rhetoric, it will not be wasted. <laughs> so, yes. There are no problems outside, really. Most of them are inside. And we go in with expectations that this is the way it will be, the ashram will be like this, the people will be like that, then you are in, in for trouble. I remember when I first entered the order, a powerful bit of advice. One or two things which have really helped me, all internal. One is the, senior, the, the head of the monastery where I joined. He, the first day as a novice, 25 years ago, he said, 
look, you have come here looking at Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, Masharada. They are your ideal, not us. You keep your eyes on them throughout your life. One. The next was when I went in to do my first bit of work for the ashram. There was a school teaching kids. And I was introduced by the senior monk there as this newcomer who was a smart young man, qualified, an MBA and all that, all that sort, of, sort of thing. And one of the teachers, who was a lay teacher, he said, Oh, we are lucky to have him. And then the monk said something which I have carried till today. He said sharply in front of everybody, No, he is lucky to be here. So uh, these are some things which help you to power through the problems in monastic life. So, I agree. <laughs> um, our Swamiji during the course had told us that uh, when we when we come to the ashram, um, he told us, "Don't think that you've you know you've conquered everything and now you're in this little piece of heaven on on earth." Um, and we all wondered what he meant by that. And then within a few weeks, we understood fully what he meant by that. Um, and his idea was the same mind that we carried before the course is what we're carrying here into the ashram as well. And so if that mind was giving problems before the course, it's going to give the same problems during the course. And the whole objective of, of studying is to learn to live with this mind and learn to uh, live with it pleasantly. Um, and that is where I think these, the internal uh, sort of difficulty or the challenge with that comes up because it's a challenging task to deal with one's own mind. And uh, as I think as, again, I can speak only from my two years of being a monastic, but, uh, or in training, I'm in training right now, but uh, um, that is certainly the, the primary obstacle, is, is the obstacle of our own, our own mind. Just as Swamiji and Shwetaji already described, the questions, the problems are not outside, they are inside. And as I am studying theories and methods, this is my argument. It should be followed by example. So from the Bhagavad Gita, if we see in the beginning of second chapter, the situation of Arjun is such that Ashru Purna Kulekshana, his eyes was, Arjun's eyes was filled with water. But that water had 0 0.3 mg salt, tears. <laughs> so this was the situation of Arjun. In the uh, very next mantras, in the ninth verse, it comes that Prahasan Eva Bharata, Arjun is crying and Krishna is laughing. So the Bhashyakar, uh, yesterday we were discussing this verse in the Dharma group during a Gita discourse. Beautifully the Bhashyakar writes, Ekasmin Paristhito, the situation was saying, Ekasmin Rathe, the chariot was saying, Ekasmin Eva Rane, <coughs> Rane that is the, on the same battlefield, there is a contrast. One is laughing and one is crying. So the situation is not outside, it is inside. And again, second example, Gita says, uh, chanchalam hi mana krishna, mind is like chanchal. So it's, it, it moves on. And there are ways to conquer it. So in our tradition, we think about there are indriyas and antakarans. For indriya, we do physical austerities, doing fasting and other things. To conquer our mind, we think about the glory of God. And in this way, we can conquer. I mean, this is what I am facing in daily life. Like, I have to wake up early in the morning. I don't like it. But uh, if I, uh, the day which I, I will like it, the, it will be the day I will wake up early in the morning, like without any efforts. But now it's difficult for me. Like, there are many difficulties. This was one example. But it, like, Reflecting it on your, taking it to yourself, it can be solved. When Akshur came and was going around his dhoti and sandals back in September, he said, it's getting a little bit chilly here. <laughs> so I told him, don't worry, it doesn't get any colder here. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. He'll run into another difficulty. And on this Friday, it is going to snow. <laughs> <laughs> this way. Namaste Swamiji, Swamini and Samiji and Professor Clooney for having such a lovely conversation with uh, monastics. Um, we are all marinated in the Upanishads, as you say. Uh, how do you find it in your own practice, being here, 
or being anywhere in day-to-day -day life, carrying that Brahmanubhava into daily uh, feeling of unity consciousness. Uh, how is that doable, possible, uh, given that you, you can get tangled up in the world? That's a really good question. Um, I remember reading a, a Swami who is uh, not of our order, a traditional monk in Himalayas, in Hindi. Uh, he says, uh, Vedant pratiti ko mitane ke liye nahi hai. Vedant aapko vyavahar mein nirbad banata hai. So Vedanta is not for uh, wiping out the experience of the world. Not for sitting with eyes closed in a mountain cave and not experiencing the world, no. It makes you, nirbad is a very difficult word to translate into English. Uh, limitless, fearless, no resistance, in the midst of all kinds of experiences. Now let me put that in practical terms, what it has meant for me. I can say this much, that I have lived in a monastery on the bank of the Ganga. I have lived uh, teaching students in dorms and hostels. I have lived on, mount, uh, on mountain tops, actually not literally in a cave, but on, in a hut begging for my food, actually sleeping under a tree in, on the Himalayan mountain besides. Um, so, and I've lived in Hollywood, Manhattan, and Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Though, I was last week in Silicon Valley and they took me down a notch. He said, they, one of them said, all of that is nothing compared to Silicon Valley. So, <laughs> <laughs> but what I can say is, you get a feeling of evenness in everything. So nothing is terrible or terribly bad. Nothing is all that fantastic either. You enjoy every situation, you see the good in it, and the bad and the difficult, you tend to overcome it. There is an internal, you feel, remain centered in something much deeper than the individual. Yeah. That's a great, great benefit. Um, one of the things from, again, from the Vedanta course, um, that I always remember is our Swamiji would tell us that uh, when you're in the when we're in the world, never to think that it's you know I'm this Vedantin against the world. Um, we're very much part of the world, and it's this very world that, uh, according to Vedanta, we have it's this world that we've misunderstood, and it's to understand it properly again according to Vedanta. That's the goal. So to look at the world and feel that. Um, uh, you know, I have to run away from it, or it has a potential to, to, to do something to me, I think uh, would not be the most effective way of, of doing one sadhana. In fact, it's to be in the world and to, and to look around and say, well, now how can I recalibrate my understanding in this same very world, um, at, you know, in the same very skin? Um, and so to never really forget that, I think, is, is what is... I mean, that has really stuck with me when, when, he, when he told us that. Um, but, but, but agreed, I think the biggest thing that can happen is, uh, and so far, again, I'm, I'm just starting, but the biggest thing uh, that can happen is, uh, is forgetting that, that uh, somehow this world um, now has some special capacity to derail me because now I know this and my knowledge is going to go away somewhere. But I think just to constantly remember that that's not the case. I'm learning to live in this world in a much more uh, uh, informed way from a Vedanta tradition. That, that's all. To me, uh, my studies of the Vedanta, as well as other my, uh, scriptures from my tradition, like Vaishnava Swaminivad, has helped me a lot. So, for example, if you see, uh, one of the words from the Vedas is Ano Bhadra Kratavo Yantu Vishwataha. Let the noble thoughts come from all the direction. So keeping this as a fundamental, as a cornerstone, if this is in mind, then uh, I'm easily able to absorb many things. Moreover, in the Vachnamrut, uh, this has been said in a very simple way uh, uh, in the Loya section about taking Gun Grahan, looking for the good things, positive things. And indeed, if I haven't studied Vedanta, then definitely I wouldn't have knowledge of Vedanta and also other things. But now, if I have studied the Vedant, I'm, I know the, well, uh, I'm trying to grasp the knowledge of Vedanta as well as also understanding and learning from other things. So 
it really helps, it enriches, in fact. Oh, yes. So I'm going to ask the flip side of the question Professor Patil asked, which is, uh, what do you hope to take away? And my question is, what do you hope to leave behind? Uh, what do you hope to contribute uh, to Harvard during your time here? Answer this one well. <laughs> <laughs> well, for example, this, <laughs> uh, but also um, a, a presence, you know, where so we, we are part of a very specialized monastic tradition, all of us, and uh, this is new for Harvard. I can I look, I'm trying to look at it from Harvard on the Divinity School point of view. So just a presence in the class and the part participation in the class, a new point of view in the class. So far, that's what we have seen. Uh, that's also helpful to you know, think about subjects in, from our particular point of view. And that's a contribution, I think. I think one other thing we, uh, we, we, we would bring, or we do bring, is um, we are first and foremost practitioners of our, of our tradition. Um, and so the perspective, for, I guess, from a practi practitioner standpoint, um, is uh, is something I, I, I hope would be uh, useful in, in this kind of setting um, about these texts that uh, you know everyone learns in an academic setting with an academic's eye. I, I would hope that our uh, different perspective can can be uh, enriching to that. Um, so. I was just here to learn, and what can I give? I am a small person, like probably the youngest in this room. But what happened was that when I reflect back my eight weeks into this course, what I see is that there are many things which have happened. So I just talked about this with Emily, that the dialogue which has started between inter-religion. So for example, uh, I many a times if somebody has questions on Hinduism, and people do have on the campus. So they, they see me and they will come to know that yes, he's definitely a Hindu. And they would <laughs> approach me and ask the questions. And we have, uh, and I try to even answer them. So dialogue. The second thing is that, uh, this is at a small level, but uh, still it makes a huge difference. So recently, the Gita study group started in Harvard. So this is a small group where anybody who's interested in studying Gita can come and uh, uh, even Tyagan Swami, Swami Sarvapriyananji, and Shwetaji, like we take alternate turns and we talk about the Bhagavad Gita. So if anybody wishes, then yes, there is an opportunity and they can learn. The other thing which uh, I can leave behind is the impression of India. So like generally uh, it is not seen from a good lens, from a good perspective. But I grew up there and I have seen it. Uh, it so happened that I'm here for a year. So uh, uh, the main person from the Office of uh, Affairs, uh, Student Affairs, said that, Akshar, you are here just for a year. So you should go for, to other events. And I went there and I saw that, uh, uh, yes, up to some extent, it is good. But like now we are, samples are here, three. Uh, go down is back home. So uh, we can come to know that there is an even a better in, uh, like footprints of India. <laughs> what Shweta Ji just said about practitioner, that sparked a thought. Um, in the study of religion, one may, the mainstream has been that you should not be a practitioner to maintain certain academic distance with the subject. Now that makes sense. But just the opposite also makes sense. I've always felt that unless you are an insider to a tradition, there are a lot of things that you do not understand about the tradition. Um, in fact, Swami Vivekananda somewhere was a little harsh on this. He said, to criticize a tradition from outside is just mischief. mischief. <laughs> so any tradition, the phenomenological insider approach, I think we need both. A scholar with a distance, an objective approach, but also what are nowadays being called scholar practitioners. And there is a growing movement. Uh, that's very useful, I think. Thank you. I have a quick question. Side, oh, please, yes. Very quick question. You saw, um, you showed us the pictures of your classes. I, I think uh, we need 
If you're in the front, we need either to speak very loud or use the microphone. Use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, we have seen the pictures of your classes. So, um, Swami Chenmaya, we saw a lot of women. We didn't see any women here and didn't see any women here. Is that uh, purpose or women are not allowed there? <laughs> um, well, yes and no. The, what you saw is the Ramakrishna order, the monks. So they are all monks. They are, it's an order entirely for men. And there is an order uh, for women. That's entirely for women. And that goes back to Swami Vivekananda's instructions that the women's order should be run independently and entirely run by them. By them. And that's being done. Uh, so that's how it works in our tradition. So you saw the, the pictures are there, yes. Uh, so Swami Chinmayananji was very, uh, uh, he very much wanted uh, women to be a part of the monastic tradition. Um, and so he openly, as I mentioned, he openly initiated women um, um, in the same way he would initiate uh, a man into the, into the tradition. Um, I believe he was one of the first to start this. Um, of course, Swami Vivekananji was, was doing it, um, but, but recently he was definitely one of the first to, to start this. Um, I'm here because he, was, he started this. <laughs> Uh, in the Swaminarayan tradition, as uh, I have grown up and as, as I have seen in it, uh, there are two kinds of diksha. The first one is Vartman diksha, in which you approach to a guru. If not guru, then you can approach to your elders and get a diksha from it. And the second diksha is for uh, the renunciants who would live their life uh, as a sadhu. So what happens is that uh, in the Vachanamru, Shriji Maharaj, that is Bhagavan Swaminarayan, says that Tyagi Gruhino Mer Nathi. So it doesn't matter if you are a lay person or a sadhu. Soteriological implications, which we call Mukti Mimansa, like anybody can attain Mukti. So in this way, there are two diksha in our sampradaya, in which, like, women also can take diksha. Anybody can take Vartman diksha. And they are allowed in each and every religious uh, rituals like doing puja, reading these holy scriptures, and also performing Abhishek this, uh, with the murti, and so on. Uh, in fact, in the United States, there, is, uh, there are convents for uh, nuns, Vedanta nuns, in Hollywood, in Santa Barbara, and in San Francisco. I had to mention that. And otherwise, the nuns would never forgive me. <laughs> so speaking of which, I think all the questions have been from men so far. So <laughs> we have about five or seven minutes left. So, 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 Oh, yes, please, okay. And we can have one from over here then, too. Please. Um, you need the mic. Speak so, very loud or use the mic. So for the women monastics, when they are menstruating, can they participate in the pujas? Um, because I read in some places, I have a friend who, it was Navratri, and she didn't even go to temple for her faith for, like, the first day because she was menstruating and, like, because she read that, you, you can't, and God doesn't even answer your prayers, or like doesn't really acknowledge you when that's going on. So I just wanted you, like, have you heard anything about that? Like, do you discuss it ever? Mm -hmm. yeah. Could the question be repeated or paraphrased? You can paraphrase it. Can paraphrase sure. The question, the question was um, to comment on whether uh, it is okay for a woman who's menstruating to. To worship, um, are there any implications of, of doing that? I think. Uh, okay, um, I will answer that question. Um, <laughs> the, so times have changed, and of course, thought changes with time. And so, um, it is it is a it is a question today that comes up, and and I've I've talked to many uh, women um, about this. Um, I think it's a matter of personal preference. If one is comfortable, then then continue, and if not, then then don't. Um, as far as what's written and what's uh, given uh, in the in the texts, it's a matter of interpretation. Then how would one, how one would like to interpret that in today's uh, day and age? Um, but I, I have always told people who have asked that it's it's up to them. Excuse me. Yes, please. Add to that. My name is Aparna, 
and I follow Sanatana Dharma. Um, it's a very interesting question you asked, and I think it's one of the most uh, misinterpreted concepts for Hinduism. Um, first of all, women were uh, worshipped upon for millennia. And uh, as far as menstruation is concerned, it was more to give women rest at the time because our ancestors and women were working hard. They had to fetch water from far away and so many other menial chores. So this was a time for them to rest. But I don't think it was ever said that this is not a time you can't pray or God will not listen. That never happened. Uh, in fact, there are temples where Devi, the goddess, is menstruating. That's right. Um, so uh, I think we respect women so much that we even think that, look, we need to pamper them, and she needs rest, and she needs her own time. I think that's what it's about. So I think we have time. Thank you very much. We have time for maybe one more question. Uh, yes. Um, so I was wondering, Swamiji, uh, is Swami Sarva Pyananda? If you Please uh, speak really loud or get the mic. Could you come and get us the mic? Yes. And this will be our last question. If you can talk a little bit more, because you had spoken in class about it, about your experience in the Himalayas, um, just how how that played into your journey, uh, monastic journey. All right, that'll be a YouTube talk. Wait, wait. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that'll take yeah. a lot. So many stories, but it's interesting. I just mentioned she sh uh, showed a picture of uh, Swami Chinmayanandaji sitting with Swami Tapuvan Maharaj. And I actually went there, exactly that spot, I mean, the, the cottage where Chinmayananji would receive classes from Tapovan Maharaj. That cottage has been beautifully maintained, and there is a very uh, lifelike picture of Tapovan Maharaj there, which I thought that there was actually a living yogi sitting right there, until I went closer and saw it was an oil painting. And uh, I have many interesting stories about that too. But wait for the YouTube talk. <laughs> So I think then we better come to a close with, um, after a wonderful evening and so many wonderful questions and wonderful thoughts. Um, I, I would hope that you know this is only the beginning. It's only early November. Certainly in the second semester we can have another such panel, another such discussion, and maybe involve some of the other monastics at Harvard to join in the, the conversation. Mary is here, one of the first Catholic nuns at Harvard Divinity School in half a century or more. Uh, but there's so many things with the Buddhist monks and others on the spiritual path to have further discussions, as well as with these three wonderful individuals. We really lucked out when we had the applications and brought in the, the names and all that and sifted through them to come up with three wonderful people who are so harmonious but also distinct and different from one another as well. So we're really lucky. Thanks to our speakers and thanks to you all for coming tonight.